It's a particularly profound human experience that has gone on since people first noticed the sun dropping into the horizon, the moon taking longer. It's the way in which we learned how to mark time, observe the changing of the seasons, and essentially make the earth a sacred place. And speaking of making the earth a sacred place, I think we all want to give a moment to look around us and think about the world that we are inhabiting right now that is kind of spinning out of control. We're a gathering sort of animal, human beings are. And it's becoming difficult for us to get together. Families are struggling. People are having difficulty going into public places. But we need to remember that this is a marathon and not a sprint. We have a long way to go to get out of this thing and we need to moderate ourselves in terms of the kind of panic or enthusiasm to get out of this or the eagerness that we feel. So let's show love, have compassion and celebrate one another as we are entering the longest night of the year and the shortest day of the year. This is a real opportunity for us to reflect on the things that are critical to the world in which we live. So I'd like to ring the singing bowl. Let's have a moment of silence, please. We're going to have a little bit of a change in the order tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Will. And instead of reading a poem, we're going to have a ritual by my good friend, Amanda Yates Garcia. And then we're going to go into the evenings. All right, Will? Thanks, Dana. <clears throat> and thanks for being back with us, Amanda. We haven't seen you since we were still in the living room uh, and the world was still uh, turning as normal. Um, and uh, speaking of turning, it's a really cool evening. Um, and I know many of our audience members uh, come to myth as storytellers. And so when we talk about the solstice, I just wanna uh, hit the note that, that the solstice is the turning point in a story. It's when things go from darker and darker and darker and colder and colder and deader and deader. Uh, to there being new light. Um, for, for screenwriters, it's the transition from act two to three. So hopefully you guys will enjoy that and you'll keep up with that as we go. Uh, it's real honor to, to have a ritual tonight to um, recognize the transition of time. And I wanna hack into our winter solstice event that we already did this year on the Green Knight, because for the Anglo-Saxons, the winter solstice, Christmas and New Year was all the same night. So that night that uh, the Green Knight was decapitated that we went into, uh, earlier this year uh, was was also on many of these themes. So I look forward to deepening and expanding those tonight in totally new ways. <clears throat> First, I want to welcome Amanda. Uh, Amanda, who some of you have not met yet, is a writer, witch, oracle of Los Angeles and host of the Between Worlds podcast. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle, London Times, CNN, and Fox. Uh, she's led rituals, classes, and workshops on magic and witch witchcraft at UCLA, UC Irvine, MOCA, CalArts, the Hammer Museum, LACMA, the Getty, and many other venues. Thank you for joining us, Amanda, uh, and thank you for helping us move through the solstice tonight. I'm so honored and delighted and grateful to be here with all of you, with you, Will, with you, Dana, and all the panelists. Thank you so much for having me. I'm not going to do a very long and elaborate ritual, but I just wanted to take a moment to do something to help us um, really settle in and recognize the sacredness of this moment, the winter solstice. The, as Dana was saying, the, the longest night of the year, in my tradition of witchcraft, this is the holiday of the old one of the crone. It corresponds to the planet Saturn, who is the keeper of boundaries and the lord of time. 
And in Earth-centered traditions, it's common that the holidays that celebrate the darkness also imply a return of the light. Similarly, the holidays of the light imply a return of the darkness as we're spinning through time in this cyclical pattern. These are called the cross quarter holidays, the solstices and the, sorry, the quarter holidays, the solstices and the equinoxes. And they mark time and they help us remember where we are and help us become present in our lives. Specifically, the winter solstice is known as the time of prophetic dreaming where we blend into the universal, where we release our sense of individuality and individualism and return to the one. And then from that, the consciousness of the one is reborn into the life, into life, into light. And the, the cycle starts over again in the summer solstice. That's the time when we speak these dreams that we receive in the winter solstice and offer them to the people and to the community. So with that in mind, I just want to take a moment to do some ritual actions to help us all ground into this time and really make the most of it. So I invite you, if it feels good to you, to soften your gaze. I like to place my hands on my heart. You can also close your eyes if that feels better to you, if it helps you get a little bit more grounded. And we're just going to start by listening to the sounds that we hear without judgment, but just noticing how they move through the air, through the space. Drawing your consciousness closer in and feeling the temperature of the room, the feeling of the air on your skin. Feeling the outside moving inside as you draw your breath in. Feel your collarbones lifting, your rib cage expanding, your core your organs contracting as you exhale. Feeling the rhythm of your heart beating, connecting you to the oceans, to the rivers, to the rains, to the tides. Feeling the weight of your bones, the material of your bones resting on the earth supported by the earth, made of the same stuff as the roots of trees, fossils, crystals, the tectonic plates. Feel the heat of the core of the earth as it radiates up through the earth's mantle and crust into your body and feel the heat of your body Connecting you also to the heat at the center of the solar system, the light of our sun, our star. And take a moment to really tune into your heart and listen. Offer some gratitude for this space, this time, this sacred moment. Offer some gratitude to yourself for bringing yourself here to honor this moment in time. And all the beings and all the love that makes your life possible, the lives that nourish yours, the pollinators, the fish, the plants, the wind, the rain, your friends, your family, And notice, too, what happened for you this year. What, what are you needing to let go of into that infinite, expansive time, into the realms beyond Saturn, back into the collective, into the mycelial roots?
offer up the gift of this experience to the compost to feed the life force to nourish and sustain other beings just as one day you will also just as you today are nourished and sustained now and stay in this reflection as I light a candle in honor of the spirits who have gathered with us tonight spirits of Hecate, spirits of Saturn, spirits of the winter solstice, spirits of Yule, spirits of fire, air, water, and earth. Thank you for your presence and your blessings. I want to close this little opening ritual with a song for my tradition to the triple goddess, the moon goddess. Hecate, Artemis. Horn maiden, huntress, Artemis, Artemis, maiden, come to us. Silver shining wheel of radiance, radiance, mother, come to us. Honored queen of wisdom, Hecate, Caridwin, old one, Come to us, come to us, come to us. The guardians are here and we are between the worlds. to each of us alone, then go silently beside us out into the night. Before we begin, these are the words, welcome words we hear. Let your senses go to the limit of your longing.
It's now my honor to introduce the panel tonight. Uh, Dana, you know, contributes to the faculty at Pacifica Smith PhD program, hosts the Smith Salon, edits volumes on mythology. My name is Will Lynn. I founded MythHouse.org in the general education department at Hushin College, where I teach myth to storytellers. Uh, we have Dennis Patrick Slattery with us tonight, who is the distinguished, distinguished emeritus professor in the mythological studies program at Pacifica Graduate Institute. He's the author, co-author, editor, or co-editor of 30 volumes of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, including his latest collection, The Way of Myth. His paintings, poetry, writing, and upcoming events can be found at DennisPatrickSlattery.com. Dr. Tarya Ward is with us again tonight, uh, founder of Bridging Worlds Mountain Retreat Center, who carries a PhD in depth psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute. Becca Tarnas is with us, is, is with us again as well, uh, a scholar, artist, and expert on Jung, Tolkien, and archetypal astrology. Her PhD from, P, from CIAS is in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness. She's leading a course on archetypal astrology right now. Joe Bogorad is with us for the first time tonight. Uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, Dr. Joseph Bogorad holds degrees in English, religious studies, environmental studies, mythology, and depth psychology. He's currently a lead coach with United Mindfulness and is the author of Cultivating the Still Point, writings on Buddhism and Christianity through the lens of depth psychology. And uh, I want to note uh, Amanda, uh, who just led us in that ritual, uh, is in high demand tonight on the solstice and will be leaving us midway through for another uh, ritual. Uh, and <clears throat> now I get to welcome Jonas, uh, Robert A. Jonas, uh, who holds an Ed D from Harvard University and an MTS from Weston Jesuit School of Theology, is the author of The Essential Henry Nguyen. Robert A. Jonas was trained in object relations psychology at Harvard and used his postdoc master's in spirituality from Weston Jesuit School of Theology to explore the healing resonances between Christian contemplative prayer, psychodynamic psychotherapy, and Buddhist uh, specifically uh, Vipassana, Zen, and Tibetan meditation. Uh, Robert Jonas was, uh, oh, <laughs> and there we are. Thank you, uh, Robert, uh, for being with us. Looking forward to getting into the winter solstice with you tonight. Ah, thank you, Will. <clears throat> thank you, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. I'm, I'm with you from Northampton, Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, uh, very near Smith College, just across the river. And I'm uh, sitting in the Empty Bell, which is uh, a retreat center that I founded in 1994. It's kind of Zen style. And I've been leading Zen and uh, Tibetan Christian dialogues, and Jewish Christian dialogues, Eastern and Western, you know, the larger picture of planetary spiritualities that I'm familiar with. Um, so I want to begin tonight with a, oh, I should say, that, uh, that video that we saw is on YouTube. Um, I have a lot of videos on YouTube. And the shakuhachi music that you heard is looks like this in the written form. This is katagana script uh, from Japan. My teacher is Yoshio Kurahashi in, in, uh, in Kyoto. And uh, I learned uh, this shakuhachi in 1991 when I was in seminary. It, excuse me, and a teaching fellow stood up and played this instrument. And uh, it's just a piece of bamboo and the breath. That's what makes the music. And um, so I learned how to play and um, went to Japan and came back. And um, it's always been central for me in the Buddhist Christian dialogue, speaking about breath, the pause between the breaths, like the pause between the tilt of the planet toward and away, uh, breathing out. There's that delicate pause breathing in that delicate pause. And I, I love um, I love what Amanda shared. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, so grounded in, in the earth and uh, our bodies is so beautiful. Um, and um, I, I want to stay grounded there as I go out into the planetary situation and into the darkness beyond our planetary situation, into the darkness, into the dark darkness. And, um, and I'll, I'll return to Earth, too, but um, let, let, let me begin with this imagination. Um, imagine that right now you are sitting on a habitable planet surrounded by a thin layer of oxygenated atmosphere, turning around in an infinite cosmos, sitting still on a planet that is moving through empty, uninhabitable space on its axis at a thousand miles per hour, 
spinning around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. And as you know, our Earth, and therefore we, rotate once on the axis about every 24 hours as we circle the sun, which takes about 365 days for us to go all around the sun. And our solar system, Earth and all, whirls around the center of our galaxy at almost 500,000 miles per hour. Everything is moving all around us and we are protected um, by this atmosphere, by this beautiful Earth that is right now in such danger um, uh, environmentally as we know. Um, and one result of the Hubble telescope findings is that our whole galaxy is accelerating outward and expanding outward, no matter where you are located in the cosmos. Go to any planet, go to any galaxy, you would see the same expansive and accelerating phenomenon happening at the same speed. Here in the planetary solstice that we're experiencing, I've been drawn to this encompassing infinite darkness. And I want to begin with this largest possible view of darkness and then return to the solstice and the earth. And I'm doing this to look for bridges I'm just so interested in looking for the bridge between the cosmic reality and our and our own intimate personal awareness and the awareness that we share with others, humans and other creatures. What does this massive phenomenon of the cosmos and our and our perilous situation as we rotate in empty space have to do with our inner life and our awareness? My curiosity led me to contact, as I was preparing for this uh, time with you, led me to contact Stephen Martin, an astronomer in the Consciousness and Transform Transformative Studies program at John F. Kennedy University, and a lead teacher for the Deep Time Network. Stefan highlighted something about our surrounding reality when he told me that while science can tell us where the Big Bang happened, science cannot tell us what existed before the Big Bang. Thomas Berry and Brian Swim, as you know, call it the great, the Big Bang, the great flaring forth. It's a name I like better. The Big Bang was made up by a, a male physicist, I think, and um, great flaring forth sounds more like a, like a birth to me. Science can tell us that our galaxy and the surrounding two trillion galaxies are expanding outward, but can't tell us where we're going. Isn't that amazing? We don't know where we're going. There's no discernible outer edge. Basically, in the picture, in the big picture of our situation, um, we can't say anything definitive about where we come from or where we're going. I'm so fascinated by that, the biggest picture I can imagine. We are fairly certain that the Big Bang happened about 13.8 billion years ago and that our planet took form for our planet Earth 4.5 4 billion years ago. But according to Dr. Martin, science cannot tell us where the Big Bang happened because it didn't happen in a place. At that no time, no dash time, there was no such thing as place or time. No location anywhere, no matter where one is in the cosmos. This is an additional fact that really blew my mind. No, no matter where one is in the cosmos, when one looks out, one sees the cosmos expanding outward from wherever one is. Therefore, one might say that the universe is expanding outward from where each of us is, as if each of us is standing at the point, the very point of the great flaring forth, the no place and no time of what, of what one astronomer can only call there be dragons. They don't have a word for this. Dr. Martin says that it's as if the great flaring forth happened wherever you are, in you, in your house. Wow, that just really astounded me. And uh, so I started thinking about what does that mean? You know, practically on the earth, what does that mean? Um, we've all heard the news that whatever is out there is also in here within us. We've been called cos cosmos sapiens or star sapiens. But I think that this mirroring and resonance of our cosmic identity goes even deeper. 
And the solstice darkness is a good time to go spelunking into this bigger darkness. If elements of the expanding cosmic community of two trillion galaxies, each one, by the way, with about a hundred billion planets. Now, if, if that doesn't blow your mind, then you should turn off the TV because this is the, our true situation. This is the news that really matters. Those two trillion galaxies are streaming forth from within us because the great flaring forth happened within each one of us. So I can imagine that the infinite seed of cosmic pre-existence, that place of no time and no space is within us. I make the imaginative leap uh, based on my experience in the contemplative community. Um, and basically I've been uh, you know, leading contemplative retreats in silence um, in the Abrahamic and Eastern spiritualities, um, primarily Jewish, Christian, and then uh, in, in Buddhism, uh, Vipassana, uh, Zen, and um, Tibetan traditions. We might say that the seed of consciousness is born here within us, within each one of us the original seed of consciousness, uh, which as, as we all know has developed so extraordinarily through the process of evolution on this planet, but the seed of consciousness is there at the beginning and the beginning is in us. This seed in our consciousness still resonates with the original no time and no place of the Holy One, the creator, the Dharmakaya in the Hindu tradition, Brahman which is, as you know, the highest universal principle, the ultimate reality. Everything, including our consciousness, is born forth from that dark place that is no time and no space. And that, that no place and no time is within us as a direct experience. From my decades of experience as a therapist, spiritual director, leader of interfaith retreats, I have noticed that when people discover the great flaring forth within themselves, they realize the depth of awareness that brings their lives alive in joy, compassion, empathy, creativity, and love. Not a, not a sort of everyday kind of love. That not, not, this is not Hallmark card territory. This is a love that includes everything. It, the worst suffering and pain and fear and the joy and the, the, the beauty of interpersonal relationships. This is a love that transcends everything. And it, it's, it is a love that has no adequate image of anyone or anything. This is a love that one can, where one can discover the depth of unimaginable suffering because every structure of denial has been dissolved in this limitless love that can handle and transform any pain now, I learned this in lots of ways in my own life. I just have to mention and not to focus on myself, but to you know, offer an opportunity for you to maybe um, find places like this in your life. Um, I grew up in an alcoholic home. Um, uh, my parents had a bar and uh, owned a bar in northern Wisconsin. They came home at 2 p.m., uh, 2 a.m., sorry, <laughs> I wish, uh, drunk and hitting each other and shouting and calling each other's names. I was in trouble with the law. I was arrested for breaking and entering when I was 12. Um, the only thing that really touched me in that, that pain was that grandma had pictures of Jesus around the house. And I learned later it wasn't the real Jesus, that there are no photographs of Jesus, but that um, this, this Jesus that she pictured everywhere in her house was painted by Warner Solomon, who had a mystical experience of Jesus. And I was touched early on in that, in that pain of my, uh, that alcoholic home by the sense of a presence of someone who loved me when I felt abandoned. My father left, parents are divorced. The shame that comes with that for a boy um, was very powerful for me. So when we are in darkness, when people sit in the silence, uh, contemplative silence, everything can come up. Things that we've forgotten or denied, um, joyful things too, but also great pain. And I've discovered for myself in, in the Empty Bell community, we, 
we're always somehow um, supporting each other to be open to that great love that includes everything. The Trappist monk Thomas Merton called the place of no, the place, the touch of the placeless and timeless uh, before the great flaring forth, le point vierge, the virgin point. This placeless place within us is unsullied by our beliefs, our opinions, and our narratives. All stories, underneath and within all stories about our situation. When we dwell in that place of being, we are free of ourselves free of our ego selves, I guess you'd say. We need an ego um, to operate in this world. Um, and people who don't have an ego suffer and people around them suffer. But I think what happens in spiritual practice um, that I've been involved in is that the ego becomes transparent to a light that is a light one can only see in the darkness. Buddhist teachers say that we die before we die. What dies? What dies? What dies is our allegiance to being right and making others wrong. What dies is our con countless ways of denying reality and our fear of death. We begin to live as if before and after our own death. <laughs> Lately, some of us have been saying, I'm dead. Holy cow. But I'm here. I woke up one morning and that just felt so true. I mean, it was, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, I woke up and um, I had been sitting with a friend who had recently died. Um, and uh, this was Bob Morrison, a Tibetan teacher. He died of cancer. Um, he, he taught at the Natural Dharma Fellowship here in New England. Um, Bob, God bless him, died recently. So after a long grueling bout with cancer and all the radiation and chemotherapy and, and also lots of um, medicinal drugs that he was trying and, or plants that he was trying, nothing really saved his life. Two days after his death, a mutual friend and I sat next to Bob's body, which was covered by a large colorful blanket, red, blue, white, and gold, so beautiful. And across the top near Bob's dear lifeless face, were the letters Grateful Dead. Bob was a Grateful Dead fan, <laughs> so it was a fitting tribute to this lovely man. Through the months of treatments, through the pain and the grief about losing his beloved, he was grateful. He was grateful all the way through life and death, and now he was gone from our midst. But he's not gone for me and, and many of us. His love and gratitude live and proceed and live beyond the, the apparent boundary between life and death. Bob had surrendered his private ego self-awareness to the limitless consciousness and the love of the divine who is simultaneously within and outside of us in life and in death, on this planet and beyond this planet. The everyday world of the ego self lives in the midst of a causal network. Everything is caused by something else in this world. It's a world of reaction rather than response. But the virgin point in our psyches, in our psyches transcends the ego self, living from a placeless and timeless place that ancient Platonists and Christians called the uncaused. God, the creator, is uncaused. In the Jewish tradition, there are so many names, beautiful names of God. One of them is Ein Sof. Ein Sof is the no end, the God of no, no end, no limit. God, the creator is uncaused outside and inside the network of causation. And you have, for me as a Christian, I think about it. Well, if, if something caused God, there would have to be a creator of God. Well, who's the, who would that be? Meister Eckhart uh, in the 13th, 14th century um, surmised that there is the, in, an invisible, placeless, timeless Godhead, Gottheit in German, that is the source of God in, in this world. I find that an interesting idea that really connects with um, contemplative practice. It's a dark place, 
before and inside and outside the phenomenal world. We can find this placeless dark place in meditation and prayer. With the discipline, it takes great discipline, it's not easy, of surrendering our attachments, especially to being right. Um, I mean, the professional training that I had um, as a teacher and as a therapist and as a theologian was in academic environments was very much about, um, uh, I hate to say it, but being right. You know, you, we, we learn certain um, practices, certain theories, and then we have to go out and sell our services to others. So we have to be right to survive. We have to say something original. We have to draw our attention to ourselves. And so that makes spiritual practice uh, in the darkness very difficult. What's left when we give up everything? Um, I think, in my experience, only love. Love is what's left. Um, I'm reminded of something uh, Choyam Trungpa said, uh, a great Tibetan teacher. He said, the bad news is that we're falling, and the good news is that there's no bottom. And uh, somehow I find that comforting. <laughs> um, there's nowhere to fall except in, into love. I think of Dante um, on his long journey from hell through purgatory and up the seven mountains of paradise. Dante is finally led to gaze on the dazzling light of what he called the Trinity. For him, three rainbows reflecting on one another. While striving to penetrate that mystery, his mind was suddenly struck by a great flash of understanding. I've been very interested in what was that flash that he experienced like a wheel in perfect balance turning. And we think of the planet in perfect balance turning. He says, I felt my will and my desire impelled by a great love that moves the sun and the other stars, an infinite love. On a similar ecstatic note, St. Augustine concluded his City of God with this hymn, there we shall be still and see. We shall see and we shall love we shall love and we shall praise. Behold what will be in the end, without end. For what is our end? But to reach that kingdom, and I have to say queendom, which has no end, a limitless kingdom of a universe that is really um, moving through empty space with dark energy. And maybe that dark energy is the spirit. That's how it feels to me. How much time do I have? How am I doing? <laughs> Maybe Dana can jump in, tell me. I would say another 20 or 30 minutes. Okay. Maybe, let, let me um, interrupt then with um, Are you Shakuhachi. Please, wonderful. <laughs> okay. All right. So the Shakuhachi, um, this, this instrument has been with me since 1991. And when I lead retreats, I always bring it. Uh, you remember Kung Fu, the series back in the 50s, 60s? Um, Kung Fu carried his flute on his back when he confronted the bad guys. And um, that's always touched me. And I, I feel the same way about my flutes. Um, I have a lot of them. There are four holes on the front and one in the back. And you blow across the back, top like a soda bottle. When I first started, it took me three months to learn how to play a note. And the, the spiritual practice for Buddhists is called Ichian Jubutsu in uh, Japanese. And it means, or one translation is to become Buddha in one sound. So as a contemplative practice, um, we bring, f bring our full awareness or as much as we can of our, our body awareness, our mind, our heart awareness into every outbreath and to pause and breathe in and then another out breath through the bamboo. So it's a cooperative venture with the bamboo and human breath. And for me in the Judeo-Christian tradition, breath is sacred. Um, in the Jewish tradition, Ruach, breath of God, is our breath. Every breath is a gift from the limitless love of God and um, in the Christian tradition, it's hagios, in Greek, hagios pneuma, 
which is the holy breath. Uh, that holy breath is how, why we're living here, why we're breathing. We're given that breath. So here's, I'll just play a few notes from the Shakahachi. Did I show the music? I forget. I did. Okay. Yeah. This is, okay. Got it. spirit comes in in Fudo there's a there's a warrior outside each temple I mean in, I'm sorry in Japan there's a warrior outside each temple door and that spirit is called Fudo Fudo guards the entrance to the holy temple so that no one with selfish intentions can can come in and he holds a sword like this is serious this is life and death so when I go I'll go to the upper octave that's when I bring in more Fudo energy. Um, there's Kuan Yin energy, beautiful openness, more the, uh, and then the, uh, the more animus energy of Fudo. taste of shakuhachi and I, I'd like to um, navigate with shakuhachi over to the Christian tradition just for a moment um, Can't help falling in love with you, um, Elvis. He didn't write that, but you know he made it fam famous for many of us um, in the fifties. Can't help falling in love with you is a touches the longing I experience in the silence of the contemplative practice. A longing for there's only other way to say it. It's limitless love. You know, love that includes everything, and 
a love from that births everything forth. Uh, we're going to celebrate uh, Christmas here for Christians, and um, it's not only that um, Mary gave birth to Jesus, but that in that moment when Mary gave birth to Jesus, Mary became the mother of God, which for me adds a really important feminine dimension to the holy. Um, of course, the holy has no gender. Um, we know that, but but for from our human perspective, it's it's so beautiful to be able to navigate images, various images of God. Um, so we have here in the empty bell many many different images of uh, feminine and 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 masculine images. Um, we have a Dorhe Drolo, which is a fierce god from the uh, Tibetan tradition. We have Kuan Yin from the uh, um, Buddhist tradition. We have Mary. She's here somewhere. <laughs> Um, we need these images, but there is there is this still point within us for me that is beyond all images, and the I think the beautiful thing about that place is that knowing that place, touching that place because I can't own it. No, none of us can own that place. Um, I I feel I feel free free of my opinions, which is a great experience to have. Um, the first retreat that I ever did was uh, at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies, some of you know, in uh, Barry, Massachusetts. And um, I went there because my mother-in-law was a teacher at Barry. Um, so we had many conversations in the household with Joseph Goldstein and Sharon Salzberg and those folks. And um, but the, in that first retreat, it was a 10 day retreat. And um, uh, day three, I started to go crazy in the silence. I, I couldn't I couldn't stand the silence. I was so nervous and I had I, I really wanted to get out. I imagined that I could quietly leave at lunchtime and go back to Cambridge to my apartment. I mean that's how bad it was. But as I sat there, um and and I was getting upset at other people, like like the woman who always wore the same dress and she would she would took her so long to settle in and I got irritated just watching her and and you know this this guy who was fiddling with his fingers all the time as he sat still I just got so judgmental about everybody and then what happened something changed in me at one point it was, I think it was day three or four I I just I was so disgusted with um my inner life because what I noticed is my it was as if I was in the middle of a merry-go-round and I was seeing the same circling of the same wooden horses over and over and over. And what were the wooden horses? They were my opinions, my political opinions, my religious opinions, my psychological opinions that I just rehearse all the time. And in conversations with people, I'd say the same things over and over. These horses were circling around and I what, what happened in me is I thought, is that all I am? Is that all I am? These stories that just keep circling and circling. And I was disgusted with myself. And so I, um, I started to cry. And then I started to weep. And the tears were falling on the meditation cushion. And I thought, oh my God, this is all I am. I'm nothing. I'm nothing except my opinions. And um, and then what happened for me is in the tears came this, this, this love that I've been talking about, this love that felt just limitless, like this love includes all my, everything and is okay about my opinions, has no judgment, no judgment whatsoever. <laughs> At first I thought, oh, you poor thing, you know, that's all you are. But, but it was greater than that. It was a bigger love. Um, I love you. Um, I see you, I know you, and I love you. Like that, that is the ultimate, that is, the, that is what's stirring in the still point beyond all our stories and opinions. So maybe I'll just say one more story and then I'll stop. Okay, so um, I started The Empty Bell in 1994 and I've been leading these contemplative retreats. Some are just for Christians who are more in the mystical dimension, and some are for um, 
um, Christians who have left and then they become Hindus and Buddhists and and we have these uh, we share silence and scriptures from different traditions. And it's been so lovely for me to be a, a leader without leading. Um, I've learned how to let go of my professional identity or to be more detached from it. I still can make diagnoses in my head, you know, and I can still think, well, that's theologically, that doesn't make any sense. But my practice is to let go of all these uh, professional judgments and opinions. And that's the kind of space I, I try to create for everyone who comes to the Empty Bell in the various groups, is the freedom of being free from yourself. Um, so I was diagnosed with, this is the last story, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer um, seven years ago and um, moved to, had to move to Cambridge, um, to Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and um, Margaret, my wife, was so, so um, you know, it's just, she loves me. So she came along for the whole, the whole deal, three months of radiation every day. And what happened in the three months of radiation was I knew those machines were driving these, these invisible dark, dark energy, of, a killer energy into my body where I had tattoos on my body to kill those cancer cells. And I was so thankful and grateful and I had to completely trust, you know, these medical people that they knew what they were doing because this is dangerous situation. So I felt that I had Gleason 9 out of Gleason 10 for any men who have prostate cancer, you know what that means. 10 is the worst, you're on death's door. I had nine. Um, and, and so prayer came to me <laughs> and the prayer that came to me when I lay down on the radiation bed every day for the almost three months was burn away everything that is not love. Burn away everything is not love. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about anything um, except love. That's all that matters. So when Choyam Trungpa says, bad news is that we're falling and the good news is there's no bottom. That invisible bottom for me and you know, I'm not saying anybody else has to experience this. I'm just sharing my experience. But that bottom, that invisible bottom is a limitless love. That's what it is. Thank you, Jonas. Wow. Um, in, in gratitude to uh, Amanda for, for still being here, uh, I wanted to go to you first, uh, if, you have any, if you have any reflections or thoughts um, while you're still with us. Wow, do I have reflections or thoughts <laughs> <laughs> on, on such a profoundly moving and universal discourse? Hmm. I mean, I was just really struck by the the beauty of what you were saying, and um, Jonas, and 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 the gratitude that I had to to be present to that and witness that. And I think for me, what it really gets at is um, that our spiritual traditions, uh, our recognitions of the holidays the solstices, the relationship to time, to the beginning of the universe, to the material world, to spirit, that all of that um, is so much more than just um, an intellectual exercise. But that is something that um, that gives us like a, a, a rope a rope to hold on to in that state of perpetual falling. Um, that love is that thing that we can be with. And um, yeah, I'm just really struck by by the interweaving of all the different connections between the d different spiritual traditions and how ultimately, you know, we're all coming from um, the same essence or reaching towards the same things. And um, yeah, so so I was, I was very moved by that. Thank you. 
I don't I don't know how to exactly approach from just like um, just my reflections, <laughs> but if there was like a specific thing. Um, I was specifically very moved by the idea of uh, us be being the center, the uh, constant, like um, millions, billions, infinite centers to an infinitely expanding universe. And um, how that is so far beyond our, our real understanding is like limit, very li our intellectual capacity is so limited. And yet, um, and yet it gives us something to, to be able to, to find that, that center, even when we're on our deathbed or we're confronting the loss of um, people that we, that we truly love and we can't imagine living without. Mm -hmm. And how so many people are going through that very experience right now and um, we see it accelerating outwards in all directions now. And um, I think for me, it comes back to the music. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, that moment stands out to me a lot too, that, that part of this, <clears throat> everything coming out from the center just constantly uh, everywhere is a center and everything's always growing from that out of that center. Um, I just did a um, uh, recorded some episodes for a documentary series and we did an episode on the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark goes in the center of the world in the center of, of the temple, which is in the center of the world oh, and it sits over the Tahome, the waters of creation. Uh, and it's, you know, the idea is that everything emanates from here as though it's the kind of um, uh, big bang or something like that. But in the Ark, you kept making me think about it is the rod of Aaron mm -hmm. and the rod of Aaron is ever blooming, ever growing constantly. There's just endless. And so connecting that image of the rod of Aaron to the ark, which is there in the center. Um, I just wanted to share that kept coming to me while you were talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. You know, Joe, uh, I know that, that uh, you're with us tonight because these themes are, are especially close with you. Um, Wondering if you have any initial responses or thoughts you can lead us in with. Well, yeah, actually, uh, Jonas, you're my long lost brother. <laughs> I, I resonated with everything that you said. It was, it was wonderful. I, um, I, I thought, you know, in, in the, um, well, the first thing that came to my mind was in a, a tape that I had heard the Dalai Lama and he was questioned about, um, do you believe in the Big Bang Theory? And he said, uh, yes, but only if there were many Big Bangs. And it's kind of like, yeah, what came before the Big Bang? And, you know, you open it up that way, and it was so terrific. Um, one of the themes that I loved was the um, universal expansion. And Amanda, with the breath, was talking about the expansion of the in-breath and the contraction of the, um, of the out-breath. And, you know, it's kind of like, it gets us to the, the flavor of subliminal processing. And that's kind of where the subliminal processing to me is where, the, uh, where we find the still point. You know, we're, we're at that place that's beyond time that you talked about, beyond space. And ah, it's just, you know, you're flowing, flowing in the depths of this whole thing. And I, um, I especially appreciated that you brought up Eckhart because Meister Eckhart and the ground of being and that place where humankind and God like, you know, flow together, just amazing thoughts and I, I probably should uh, leave this last piece to um, the master of Dante, uh, Dennis Slattery, but uh, I will never forget in Dennis's class when, when we got to the final chapter of uh, Paradiso 
and you were talking about the um, you know the the rainbows coming together, and that last piece was that that where where the um, the poem ended was that it became beyond concepts, beyond words, and that Dante just had to leave it because there was no more poetry that could be expressed at that place that he was at. And I also, my God, the music is just, um, in a way it's hauntingly beautiful. It's like, it really takes you deep and, and it seemed to fit into this whole theme of the uh, winter solstice. And I'm just so, so glad that I was invited to be with you mm. tonight. And so thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Oh, maybe I can mention one quick thing that uh, every, we all know, or maybe maybe we all know the work of Meister Eckhart and how important he is, um, especially for those, those of us on the contemplative way. Um, what many of us don't know is that he had a, a woman teacher uh, who was Marguerite Poirette. Marguerite Poirette um, lived in 13th, 14th century. And she, some of her lines can be found in T.S. Eliot. I was talking with Dana about this. Here's, here's four lines from Marguerite Poirette. Um, this soul that is united in love often hears what she hears not and often sees what she sees not. And so often she is there where she is not. And so often she feels what she feels not. She, she is, she is a, a, a masteress, a master of paradox and um, neti neti, as the uh, Hindu folks will say, not this, not that. Um, and those lines end up in St. John of the Cross, almost exactly. And then in T.S. T. S. Lewis, I mean, I'm sorry, in T.S. Eliot, but, but so often this great woman is not even known by most people. And, and what makes it even more terrible is that she was, um, she was murdered by the, the religious authorities. She, she was burned alive at the stake. And sometimes, you know, when I've given talks on Marguerite, I just, I, I can't help myself. I, a tear comes to my eye because she was such a beautiful writer. And if you have a chance to, to read Marguerite Poret, P-O-R-E-T-E, -E, um, she died in 1310, uh, please do. You mentioned uh, St. John of the Cross. Um, is, is the winter solstice the, the dark night of the soul of the year? Uh, 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 I don't know that he ever wrote about he, his, his uh, still point is the darkness beyond the darkness. So it's the darkness beyond the solstice. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's the birthplace of our local solstice. That's what he wrote about. Um, yeah. So he, he wrote, um, I, w I was a Carmelite for, for, for years, a lay, a lay Carmelite. Uh, associated with the monastery, and and you, here you'll see. Uh, I'll just read this two, a few lines from Saint John of the Cross, 16th century Spanish, um, and he, he really got this from Marguerite Poirette, but he doesn't he doesn't acknowledge her. <laughs> I, that drives me crazy. Okay, he says to reach to reach satisfaction in everything, desire its possession in nothing, to come to the knowledge of all, desire the knowledge of nothing. To come to possess all, desire the possession of nothing. To arrive at being all, desire to be nothing. And being nothing, that whole theme, straight from Marguerite Poret, three centuries before him. Be nothing. If we are nothing, then we're everything, because we're open to everything. We're nothing. We're not owning anything. We don't even own ourselves. So it means for her, for Marguerite, it meant giving up her personal identity and even her name, everything. Then she's free. She was free, and she was killed. She was executed for that. God damn it! Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, you you mentioned um, 
um, and by the way, if any of you guys are ready to jump in, just throw your, your mics off and I'll know. Um, but you mentioned um, uh, the Big Bang and, and, and we talked about uh, this kind of updated version of the Big Bang, but it displaces an older version of the Big Bang where the idea is that everything came from an infinitely dense point. Mm -hmm. And I think that the metaphorical you know, switch here is, is, of every, is, is entirely important, right? So if you think that everything comes down to one thing that's solid, that solid thing can't be expanding everywhere in every direction. It can't, it doesn't do that. Something solid, a little thing. This is the stone of the heart, you know, that we have to roll away. You know, this is what we have to empty. This is the paradigm of causality, is this particulated uh, worldview that was, you know, uh, um, you know, where we were when the Big Bang originally was, was put forward. Yeah, and if you bring it down to one, one point, it's one solid point, you'd have to say, where did the point come from? Mm -hmm. And then you lose the thingness of it. Yes. Hey, Dennis. Yeah, thank you. And Jonas, this was just, well, I'm going to join Joe's <clears throat> club <laughs> and claim you as a brother as well. I loved what you presented at the aging conference. You were one of the last speakers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had presented much earlier. And then I found myself uh, listening on my laptop, but typing on my other computer uh, when uh, the other speakers spoke. And where I connected with you on a level that I didn't connect with anyone else, and it's not them, it's me, is when you said, and I'm so glad that you reiterated it today, because first thing I was going to do is ask you, may I quote you from the aging conference, but you've already brought in with our group here. So where you said, my parents coming home drunk, I felt so ashamed, not feeling safe, but blessed with German grandparents and her love of Jesus. And then you really extended that uh, beautifully uh, tonight. Um, you and I share this world of violence and trauma. Uh, it was my father's alcoholism. Uh, and my mother was the object of his abuse on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And that deep shame that I still carry um, and have worked hard to befriend it uh, really uh, over the years and not be uh, conquered by it um, was, it's almost like, um, it's almost like two men that didn't know one another <clears throat> and find themselves in the same platoon in battle uh, somewhere. And the uh, bullets and you're thinking, you know, the next bullet's going to be mine. Yeah. Creates a brotherhood between them that I imagine um, that uh, I share with you with the, the trauma of uh, the violence and uh, PTSD for the rest of our lives, you know, in one form or another. So I, I wanted to voice my connection with you both then and tonight. And then the other piece that I, I just want to touch on, um, <clears throat> and it's no accident that I was, that I'm here tonight because I, I really needed to hear what you're saying to help me with an obsession that has taken over me in the last three or four days. And it, as you brought up to be still so that we can see, I wrote right under that, I'm being pulled back into a world that I no longer want to inhabit. And it's a group of people that I used to teach with before I went out to Pacifica, where I've been for 27 years, and have reconnected with them. And 
realizing and even more definitively listening to you um, that I don't want to be taken back into that world that it, it's, it's shelf life expired two decades ago. So this was amazingly helpful for me on a very personal level. And I know I'm not alone <clears throat> in saying that, but this sense of being still so one can see uh, there's nothing like an obsession to keep one from being still. And so this is, this is, a, this is very helpful. Let me say that to you. And it's, the, it's capturing something of that placelessness that it seems to me that stillness uh, advocates and cultivates. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Jonas. Thank you, Brother Dennis. Thank you. Natalia. Oh, Jonas, I um, I have so many thoughts. I need to um, distill them as I go. I'll just trust that I can. But I want to. I really want to thank you. I I I haven't heard uh, sort of a living meditation. It was almost you took us into the silence through words. Some it was it it's it's a uh, the silly words that are coming to my head is like a performance art. It's like it's art to be able to take us beyond words through your words and that beautiful way that you did and take us to a place that um, that is so deep and dark and powerful yet so bright and light and pure so I just want to thank you for for your method really of doing that and I also want to share with you I, I grew up knowing Buckminster Fuller I don't know if you know of him but um, a scientist with just such a bright mind and he was a friend of my father's. And listening to you, I, as a teenager, I was listening to Buckminster Fuller. I, I've always said he would, had more influence on me than any other person I've ever known in my life, including my parents or spiritual teacher or anybody. Um, and listening to you was like listening to him. He, he, would, he would start with the way you started about us going around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour and how quickly we're moving through space and just to get perspective on what is happening here and who we are and what we're part of. Um, and that was always important to him. And then I just recently listened to, um, for some reason, I can't even remember why, uh, a video that I found of his, there are these scratchy old videos on YouTube of Bucky speaking, but I recommend them to anybody. I wish there had been a better technology when he was doing this, but, but he was saying in this video that love is the most mysterious of the synergies that he had ever studied. And mm -hmm. He was saying in a way that I can't, I don't have the words to repeat, but he was saying it as a scientific, you know, like he understood, he said, love is like gravity. And he understood that so radiation does this and gravity does that. And he was understanding love as an element of the universe. Um, and it just, you know, he was speaking so much about love toward the end of his life. And I was thinking how Jung did the same he, toward, toward the end of his life he reflected that's that scares me don't 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 say that. no Rocky <laughs> spoke about love all through his life so i i do know that so there you go <laughs> but i'm just saying it's the final sort of truth that um you know and i hopefully at the we're at the end of an era here i think i feel like the we're living through the times that have been prophesied by you know, so many ancient traditions. So these are the, the times I think, I feel like when love now can be known in those ways where it's got to emerge, that's the only kind of truth or, 
And I just felt like your meditation on it, your reflection on it was so profound. Um, and so I wanted to share that with you. And then I also thought I'd share this, this story and I don't think I've ever said it out loud before. It's something that happened, I don't know, 30 years ago maybe. When I was standing in my home, I'll never forget it. I was standing in my home, looking out across the ocean. This is when I was still living in California. And I had a visionary moment and I saw the big bang. I could, I could still stand in the same position and point to where I saw it. And it was like Brian Swim and Thomas Berry talked about it. it was the, it was this bright flaring forth. But, and I've always known that. I've never even spoken of it, but I've always known. I saw that. For some reason, I stumbled into this moment of actually seeing that. And so hearing your reflection on this, for, I never really gave it much thought because I didn't know how to think about that. But I guess if I thought about it, I would have thought that was back in time or something, even though I know time doesn't exist. But it was also, I guess I thought of it as an event that happened. But now listening to you, I know it's an event that is happening in me. And for whatever reason, I will never now think about that experience that I think about often in the same way because of listening to you on that subject. So I want to Thank you for that. I mean, I, I, I look forward to going forward now with the meditation and the contemplations that you've that you've placed in my heart. Wow. This Whoa. Thank you for sharing that. You know, I just had a little response there that um, it's an ancient uh, tradition, both in the Greeks and the early Christians, uh, especially in the Orthodox tradition, that um, just to put it in the vernacular, what you see is what you are. You know that, uh, and Aquinas called it con naturality, uh, and Aristotle's little example he uses is that we can only see blue because we have blue in us, because we are blue, blueness itself. So when you saw the Big Bang, you saw it from being inside the Big Bang. You know what you saw outside was actually where you were standing. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I, yes, it makes sense to the extent that I it. It tells me, please meditate, Taria, on what you just said, <laughs> because, because there's a lot more sense that I hope, you know, that I can assimilate and yeah. integrate from what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's very beautiful. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, if I could jump in here next, if that's possible. Uh, this evening was so moving. And Jonas, what a blessing to hear you speak and play your music. The, this night, the solstice night feels, every year I, I feel the sacred moment of that perception of the sun standing still, as the solstice means. And I, I didn't totally know what to expect coming in here this evening thinking, you know, something perhaps more along the lines of an academic presentation, which is wonderful, but I feel like you delivered to us a sermon. And about five minutes into you speaking, I felt my whole being relax after a lot of hard work and a lot of pain and difficulty of uh, today, this week, the last year to as we've all been experiencing collectively. And it feels rare these days to get that kind of release from hearing someone speak mm -hmm. and then to hear you play. So thank you for that. That was such an unexpected blessing to receive that at such a deep level. And I, I just wanted to offer, because I am here as an astrologer, that and, and by the way, bringing in the, the primordial flaring forth and Brian Swim and Thomas Berry, I'm, Brian Swim was one of my direct teachers. So it was just so lovely to hear you speak to the hidden heart of the cosmos. And I think my work is really oriented toward the inner side of that, what the planets tell us at an archetypal level. And so I just wanted to 
name briefly one of the planetary alignments that's in the sky right now that I'm seeing refracting through this beautiful uh, presentation and conversation. And so every year we have the solstice, but every year it's also different because there are different planetary alignments at the same time. Mm -hmm. And one that's happening right now is a rare, very long conjunction of the planet Venus, which is related to the archetype of love and beauty, mm -hmm. and the planet Pluto, which relates to the depths and the underworld and intensities and extremes, but it's also the archetype of the death rebirth mystery. Mm -hmm. And hearing you speak, there was so much representation of the Plutonic, of the darkness, of that encounter with death and suffering and chaos and trauma. And then as we pass through that threshold, the recognition that it is all love on the other side of that veil. And just how beautifully you've spoken to this alignment that's here right now. And the reason I say it's a, a rare alignment is because usually when Venus passes in conjunction to Pluto, it's very short. Venus moves very fast. But just three days ago, Venus stationed retrograde and is now making her long journey into the underworld. And so we'll be lingering with Pluto for weeks and weeks. So we're in this for a while. The next exact alignment of Venus Pluto is on Christmas day. So we're in this long dance between Persephone and Hades or between Persephone and Dionysus or um, Venus and Eros um, for a while. And um, so thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just very um, moved by what you shared. And I'll just finish by sharing one very personal uh, short story that when you played Can't Help Falling in Love, long before I ever heard Elvis's version of that, when I was a baby, my dad would put me on his lap and play that song, Can't Help Falling in Love on the piano. And it's one of my earliest memories is hearing him play it long before I knew the words either. So uh, just brought up that really poignant memory. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. Um, I am so sorry. I'm going to duck out to go to my own solstice ritual now, but I'm very grateful to have been a part of it. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Oh, <clears throat> You know, I mean, uh, yeah. Let's also keep in mind that right now, with this particular solstice, this winter solstice, we're dealing with a full moon, mm -hmm. and that only happens periodically. And being excessively lunar, it's just really a challenge for me to feel the pull of the moon and the stillness of the solstice. You know, as these these tensions of these these two planetary bodies seem to be wreaking havoc I, I i don't get stuff happening from the solstice but i do get stuff happening with the moon uh, and and these cycles come in and they we're physical beings we're we're we consist largely of water and so when things happen where it motivates us to reflect upon the conditions that are happening, I'm struck by observing my own body in motion, observing the tides. I mean, the, these, are, these are things that happen in the real world, not in the in the head. They're heart driven. They're the things that are in, in me viscerally, I just, I was struck by pulling this together about what are the potentials? What are, what's going to come out of this thing? How, when we wind down in this, the days suddenly start to open up and they start to get longer again and the nights start to get shorter again. 
what's going to come forth? How are we going to move toward the summer solstice and have that awaken? Where will we be in six months from now? I mean, I think all of us thought that this, the conditions, the pandemic would be long gone. And here we are. I mean, this is, this is really a, a profound moment for us to reflect and, and have compassion for the people that, you know, aren't able to step inside warm homes and computers and talk with one another on this. I mean, um, we have so much to learn from what this opportunity is around us. I, I just, I, I lack eloquence in, in terms of trying to express it. So I just, I'm grateful, Jonas, for, you know, your eloquence and a will always, but, you know, and everybody, but, you know, um, there's these conjunctions going on. Dana, something that comes up for me is, um, yes, it's all about rhythms, you know, rhythms of day and night, for example, and the, and the tides and the breath. And um, in my initial training in psychotherapy, um, I, I'll never forget reading Freud and Freud saying, where there's love, there's hate. You know, and we sometimes find ourselves just careening through all kinds of different spaces, emotionally, psychologically, in time, in time. But there is a, this also other dimension, this timeless dimension. And for me, the own, um, it requires a steadiness of discipline, no, no matter what the, the tides bring, what, what emotions are, are drawn up, what challenges I face. In a sense, they don't matter because I'm, I'm always now. I'm always now. I'll, I'm meeting the now, now. Whatever's coming up, whether it's love or hate or light or dark, it doesn't matter. But the key thing for me is like not to get too attached to the timeless. If, if you know, in a way, in Zen they call it Zen sickness, which is attachment to emptiness. You know, um, but but if we can be in touch with the timeless truths, like uh, the timeless love and the origin, which has no name, uh, if we can stay in touch as time moves through us. Uh, then uh, we are free, free to respond rather than to react, you know. So the spiritual discipline is absolutely, I find, important. Otherwise, we're going to be careening all over the place as things go on. So. Well, that's why I, in my opening comments, said that this is a marathon, you know, and, and people will talk about running marathons, but it, a marathon is really anybody can run a marathon. It, it really has to do with discipline. And if you put in the miles, you can run it. And no, I mean, it's, I, it's true. It, it really is. I mean, it's just simply getting yourself in shape. And right now we need not to be hyper reactive to the situations that are around us, but to have patience and develop that compassion. What is compassion? You find out what compassion is by practicing it. And the more you practice at anything, the better you get at it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was, I, those of you who know me, I was, I was, a, I'm a runner and I was at the beach the other day and I stopped. There's a guy who plays guitar and he jumps up and down and he kind of like talks to everybody as they go by. And he always, I'll go running by and he goes, Hey grandpa, Hey grandpa, you know, and I just felt like this guy is one of the benchmarks on my runs. I, I, he's out there all the time. So I went back and, and I gave him $5. And turns out he's living out of his car, trying to do whatever he can. And I got, I've just been moved by the fact that the car, no matter how, how much you heat it up, it's cold. He's, he's, he's out there doing the best he can and he's, and he's doing whatever he can. And I just, I, I don't want to become distant, so distant or, or calloused or indifferent to the, the plights that different people have. You know, I, I think of Dennis being down in Texas and I hear the stories down there. I just, you know, 
I mean, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be melodramatic about the physical consequences that are happening around us, but this is heavy stuff, yeah. you know? And these are teachable moments. We have an awful lot to learn about who we are, who have, have we made ourselves out to be. Um, I've long said that this is a reaction of the natural world to humanity in one way, shape, or form. This is a metaphysical event. This is something that hum humanity has not got a hold of. And so when I think of what can we learn from the, the still point, what can we learn from the, the solstice? Well, we can learn if we listen. And if we just feel the beat of what's going on around us. And mm -hmm. I'm touched by what you say, Jonas, and thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dana. Just so many implications. Oh, thank you, Dennis, please. Just, just a brief, because Dante has come up a couple of times and you know, when I, um, before we would get into the Divine Comedy, I would spend a little bit of time on Lobita Nuova, where he wrote some 40 some sonnets to love, trying to explore what it is. And he came on this idea, intelletto de amore, the intelligence of love, mm -hmm. which I've always I've loved that phrase because it marries the head with the heart so that love itself has an intellectual <laughs> component to it. Mm -hmm. And then when he had written several, he says, well, who, who should I give these two to read? And he said, there's only one audience. <laughs> and he begins one of the sonnets with it ladies who have intelligence of love, that they will understand this. So, and then as he continues to write, he realizes the container is way too small. And I'm gonna steal this image from you, Jonas, that you are plowing into your pr presentation from others he realized that this, this intelligence of love was expanding outward and he needed a much larger container. And that becomes the divine comedy. So, I mean, he was in that kind of cosmic, intellectual, heart-oriented world of love mm -hmm. and realized that, this, that these sonnets that he had written were just the, they were the, uh, they were the they were the place for the larger uh, object to be airborne, mm -hmm. and that was the divine comedy. So it, it just felt like this conversation invited that brilliant insight of Dante's in. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Now you inspired me to reread Dante. Thank you. <laughs> You know, um, if I could say something real quickly, um, Dennis, you're talking about the, um, the heart and the intellect, and in Buddhism, the word, which Jonas knows well, sita, which is mind, heart, together. And what I also appreciate about the, the, uh, the way you present, and that you come from Christian theology, yet you still our understanding world theology and how it's really when we get to the depths of it it's all the same thing you know and that's the most amazing thing that we have to start to understand that these differences that politics and that you know geography bring up in all of us mm -hmm. and yet at the depths of our soul we're, we're all at the same place whether it's the palace of nowhere or whether it's emptiness that's the same thing and you have brought that up and and i really appreciate it because you don't hear it that often where people will will people where people will 
you know, bring the different traditions and show the similarities. Yes. I mean, my, my, uh, one of my favorite uh, people, Joseph Campbell, did a lot with that, you know, with the hero with a thousand faces. But you don't see it too, you don't see it as much in, in spirituality. And, and I love that you're doing that because it's what the world needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And, and your book is going to help with that too. Uh, and you, you brought up uh, the Palace of Nowhere. Um, so I want to bring in Jim Finley. Some of you know Jim. And um, he, his book was just so wonderful. It was Merton's Palace of Nowhere. And um, Jim and I became friends over the years recently because I, I played shakuhachi at some of his retreats. And he, he really is dancing in that still point. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I love him. Uh, and he's, he's living near you guys, I think, right? I think near Dana, Jim Finley. Yeah, he's out here. Yeah, we talked the other day. We thought he might come on here. Um, but yeah, he lives, uh, he lives here in Santa Monica. There's also Aldous Huxley. You know, I've been inspired by his work. Um, and and there, are, there are some others, but you're right. The, uh, the, the more expansive view of the common wisdom that's out there circulating in the, in the traditions is not, it, we don't hear enough of it. And I don't know, I'm curious what you think the, the problem is there. I, I think um, differences are emphasized, but on the other hand, um, I've been exploring the concept of alterity recently. I don't know if you know that term, but uh, Henri Corbin, and, uh, or European philosopher, um, uh, talks about alterity, uh, which basically means uh, otherness, but uh, otherness that um, that values differences. And and I found in my interfaith work that when I value the diff the person who's coming from a different tradition by noticing that that's really different, not trying to pave it over as we're all one, you know, but wow, that's different. When I appreciate the difference. That's what Henri Corbin was calling uh, alterity, because it's an entry point into a deeper commonality that I that, that I hadn't seen, and uh, I I realized that the beauty of otherness when um, there there are terrible ways of using that term too, but uh, C.S. Lewis's um, work a, a book called A Grief Observed, um, he he finally after so many years as a single man in England, he, and writer, um, philosopher, he, uh, he married, and, and very soon his wife died of cancer. And um, so in a, a grief observed, um, he says, what I, what did I, what I miss the most about her is the rough, sharp, cleansing tang of her otherness. Oh, <laughs> the rough, sharp, cleansing tang of her otherness, so beautiful. So traditions are like that, I think. While we're, um, one thing that's come up for me a couple of times, um, we're talking about, you know, burning out and there being nothing left, but, but love, um, comparing different traditions and, and this whole kind of going out moment. I'm always really interested in um, uh, the word uh, around, in, the words around enlightenment for the Buddha, nirvana being to extinguish sunyata, and Anatman, both being different forms of emptiness, emptiness of the world, emptiness of the self, emptiness of things, right? Um, and then, and then the lead, this is the setup of enlightenment. This is enlightenment. So you kind of got this three part, the last sliver of light, the, the extinguishing nirvana, the going out, the experiencing of emptiness, which is also an experience of nirvana is also an experience of, of bliss. Um, sunyata, Anatman, Pratika, Samapada, and then the enlightenment that falls on the other side. And it's almost like um, it's almost like this spiritual wisdom that is Buddhist enlightenment is encoded in the solstice itself. Mm -hmm. um, just these mythopoeic interpretations of the solstice as the ultimate holiday of holidays that we they're all miracles of lights we were talking about before. And whether it's the solstice or the new moon, you know, it's the last bit of light going out and the new light coming back. Uh, I think um, uh, Amanda mentioned that that Kronos and or Saturn is a symbol of the solstice. And of course, there he is carrying his symbol of the crescent moon, the, the crescent sickle mm -hmm. at the solstice. 
Um, anyway, uh, so I just I just wanted to bring in uh, the Buddhist piece on Nirvana and and that whole idea that that there is a uh, an intellectual we, we were talking about the the thought side of love, you know, the the intellectual experience of this extinguishing that generates the the, the love. Yes. Yes. And I just want. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, Becca. I just wanted to add something on um, the, this particular full moon because, so as some of you may know, the in the northern hemisphere, the sun is at its lowest in the sky in the winter, but the moon is at its highest, and so we have that contrast. Not only is the sun the light of the day and the moon the light of the night but also that the sun is in some ways the light of the summer and the moon is the light of the winter. And this I just learned this a few days ago, but this particular full moon is actually the highest, like literally the highest up that we'll see in our lifetimes. And when I went out uh, on Saturday on the full moon to, to view it, it was directly up ahead. And I never quite had that experience experience of seeing it so high because the moon of course is um, moving through a different plane than the the other planets on the ecliptic it's near but it's slightly different and so um, even though the moon is now moving toward waning just when you go out and look at the moon know that it's the highest you're going to see it in your lifetime and uh, I don't have the math yet on when the next time will be but for now just um, to recognize how that while the sun's light might be at its lowest waning, the moon's right now is at its fullest waxing in multiple senses. And what does lunar light show us that solar light can't? Um, so that's a, a question I've been holding in these last few days. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. There's another teaching in uh, uh, Buddhism called uh, impermanence, you know, that everything is passing. Um, and of course, there are passages in the, in the Psalms and Hebrew scripture about everything passing. Um, and we're passing. And um, I, when, I, when I think astrologically, Becca, which I don't do very much, honestly, but, I, but you're kind of inspiring me to inquire more. Um, I somehow have grown up with this really uneducated idea that the sun is sitting still out there and we're going around it. <laughs> but actually this astronomer informed me that the sun is moving at 500,000 miles an hour out to nowhere and we're going around it, you know, at this incredible speed. So everything is impermanent. There's, there's no place to stand anywhere. No south, no west, east, north. Uh, you know, it, it's really mind blowing. And be, but because I find it freeing in a way because there is no solid place to stand. That means I really have to be uh, awake and ready for anything because everything is changing around me. And with COVID, it's even you know, more pronounced every moment almost. Nothing is what it was. Incredible opportunity, as Dana was saying. I saw a question in the audience, um, and I hope we can hear from Taria too before we, we go again. Um, but a question from the audience is, is the virgin point the pregnant point? Are those the same points? Yes. Yes. They are the same point. It's hmm. The, the, the Le Point Vierge is where everything comes from. And um, I myself am really lately, um, it could be my wife's influence. My wife is an Episcopal priest, by the way, and she is um, making, um, making headway in um, her struggle with that uh, Episcopal tradition, which is so beautiful to, to bring the feminine perspective and the, the perspective of divine mother more central into that whole experience. So um, we're going through a lot of uh, languaging changes too. That's another thing that's happening around the planet is uh, the, the language we use to describe things in the past doesn't work anymore. I can't say the name, the word God to 
my grandkids or my son, uh, they don't, they have no reference for it. Uh, so I have to keep coming up with new ways to describe the experience of and so for whoever the Holy One. Hmm. Well, isn't it always filtered through some sort of a tradition? Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole notion of the infinite or the divine being, once it might have been just nature itself. Yeah. And as we moved into various traditions to make something other than nature or the cause of nature, mm -hmm. uh, we form traditions. And I, I like your notion of alterity that Corbin talks about because essentially when you boil it all down, we're all alone. And we kind of reach out and we form these affiliations with one another and we extend into a notion of community, but even that's limited. And so as we move further out into culture and into the world, we find that all of these boundaries and definitions are, are really contrivances of convenience, you know, of ratification of who it is that we find ourselves to be in this limited form right here. But basically we're alone. I mean, you know, um, lose a parent, lose a, a close friend, lose a sibling or something like that. And you just, the emptiness is, irreplaceable and so i i find that you know if we can cope with this alienation this kind of this we're the, the we're the one speck we have something to do with then we can form an infinite number of connections with an infinite number of possibilities mm -hmm. and it, it makes everybody you know um the recipient of the love and the joy and the, the possibilities that we bring out through ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think we're both alone and not alone. I don't know if Will reacted to that. Did you, Will? I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually, uh, uh, Dane and I agree on, on like most everything, but I'm not big on the metaphor of seeing ourselves as specs. Um, because because that's a metaphor where you project your own isolation onto yourself. Um, it's actually it's useful because it, it first it makes us realize we're small, which is is hugely hugely important. You know uh, we have to do that or else we have too big of an ego to and we really are alone. You know uh, so so the speck metaphor was did help us you know pop that solitude paradoxically. Mm. Yeah. You know, if there's can some, I jump in for one second? Yeah, um, you just, I mean, I'm just like, I'm, I'm so into the non-dual traditions that I, I love the, the idea and the metaphor of the merging of the subject and the object, the scene with the seer, and in these non-dual traditions, which can take place in Brahman as everything, or could take place in you know, in the, uh, the Trinity is everything or it could take place in Buddhism as emptiness, you know, as nothing. But the whole idea is that through contemplation, if we work at it hard enough, and I am nowhere, even anywhere near it, I'm so far from it. And I've been meditating for so long and, and, but you do start to merge with the all. You do start to see that, when you break down, you know, when, when Joe's broken down, I'm the same material that this entire cosmos is made of. And, and I'm the same as everything. It's all, it's, it's all the same. But I also understand otherness and respect it. And I understand alienation. That's why I'm not enlightened because I, I still, you know, I still have anxiety. I still have... I mean, you know, if somebody passes away, I, I, you know, with all my training, I still just like, I go one way, I go, God, why'd you do that? And then the other way I go, why don't I understand this? I've been doing Zen and, and Vipassana and Tibetan for years and years and years. And, but I think non-duality can help us. 
I think it's a good way of looking and a good a good way to a, a place to move towards. Yes, yes. I I think you suffer. I think you suffer from um, excessive humility, Joe. <laughs> no. <laughs> and honestly, by the way, speaking of non-duality, that that is uh, for for Joseph Campbell and for Carl Jung, it's the bottom point where you have the sacred marriage. It's the bottom where you have the union of opposites and where you have that transcendence of, of duality and then the enlightenment. Um, Taria, before we go, I wonder if you have any other thoughts for us. I think you're calling on me, Will, because I had unmuted earlier and I was following on, um, I had a thought following on what Dennis was saying so well said about um, the intelligence of love. And it, um, uh, it reminded me of something I'd mentioned that little uh, video on YouTube of Buckminster Fuller. There are several of them, but the one, I wish I could tell you exactly which one it was. It was so dear and beautiful, but he would, uh, for those of you who maybe don't know, he has written these tomes, you know, like 900 page books that rewrite all of mathematics because he realized the basic assumptions of mathematics were wrong. And so he re rewrote it all. I mean, such a profound intellect. I think one of the finest intellects we have in the last century. And he was asked in this little interview that somebody was giving him about, he was talking about love as this gravity. And he said, the, the only thing that has ever motivated anything that he has ever done has been because of love, because of the, his sincere passion of love um, and that, so I'm, I'm just thinking of all of the intellect of this man and, and he spoke it so beautifully. And I just thought the intelligence of, that comes out of that sincere feeling of love and, and being in his presence was an experience of just being in the presence of profound love. It was, you just were there, you knew it. So I just, when I heard you talking about that, Dennis, I thought I'd follow on just that little that little anecdote to, as well, yeah. Thank you, Will, for pulling me back in. I appreciate it. You chase it down. Oh, we're lucky to, to get to conclude towards that note. You know, thinking about love, tomorrow, uh, we, we're, we have the real privilege of tracking somebody whose life was defined by the passions of his own love, of his love for God, no, who knows what. And this is Robert Bly. Uh, he passed away, as you know, in, in November. And as happens in the myth salon, we reach out to people, all of you, all of the people who are in the, in the audience. And People show up for this. They, they, they do. I mean, they just, there's so much love in this community that it's, it's, you know, impossible to really calculate it. it it's beyond measure. And so I, I would, I would be honored just to read a short poem that Robert Bly wrote, um, attributed to St. John of the Cross called The Dark Night. And it, Bly writes, in the night that was dark, made fiery by the furies of love, oh, blessed moment. I left without being noticed. All the doors of my house closed for the night, secure and in the dark on the secret staircase stealth, oh, blessed moment. And darkness protected me. All the doors of my house closed for the night, in the delicious night, in privacy where no one saw me, nor did I see one thing. I had no light or guide. But the fire that burned inside my chest, that fire showed me the way more clearly than the blaze of noon. To where, waiting for me, was the one I knew so well. In that place where no one ever is, oh night, sweet guider, oh night, more marvelous than dawn, oh night, which joins the lover and the beloved, 
so that the love and beloved change bodies. What a treat it's been, Jonas. You know, the run up to these is sometimes, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a privilege to engage the various people that we participate with. And I would say, if you got this email, you got the one on Robert Bly tomorrow. We are so privileged. We have several people Michael Mead is going to run the show tomorrow. And then we have a fellow named Hayden Reese. And if you Google this guy, he has, he's developed films on Robert Bly. He has a, a thousand years of joy coming out. Uh, it's a documentary on Robert Bly. And I tracked him down and he's gonna be with us tomorrow. And so I mean, what, a, what a community we've built, but it's building itself. I mean, the community is like a, an organism without a leader. It just is something that wants to be, you know? I'm just, I, I feel just, immensely grateful to, to have met Will, to have met all of you. I dragged Joe in here again, but Joe is a friend from way back. And I just, you know, I love you, man. So let's, uh, let's give just a, a moment of silence as we go out one more time. Go forth, everyone. Be safe. Have wonderful holidays. I would also going to throw one more thing in there. Check out the Stonehenge activities that are going on tonight and tomorrow morning. Um, I'm going to share the screen one more time. No, I'm not. Stonehenge, they've got these activities. And I mean, if there was a place custom built for this, for the solstice, it's the Stonehenge. So love you all. Wait a minute, I, I, I love you too. I suddenly now I, <laughs> I have new friends. This is great. I, um, I, this is a little, I'm sorry. I don't mean this to be marketing or anything, but, but I have a book coming out in, in April or May from Orbis. And it's called from Marguerite Poirot. Her name for God was my dear far nearness, my dear far nearness. And, you know, trying to trying to put some language on this experience of the Holy One, the source of, of the whole creation being inside and outside simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So that that will uh, my dear far nearness comes out from Orbis in April or May, somewhere in there. Thank Good. you. Excellent. Congratulations. I'll make sure it gets on the tape. <laughs> okay. Actually, it's not a tape anymore, but you know. Okay. Good night, all. Thank you. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you. Thank you all. A beautiful, wonderful evening. night. Thank yeah. you, Jonas. Thank you. Bless you. Thank, Thank you, all. everyone. It's a beautiful night. Thank Happy you. solstice and big old moon. I'm going outside to look at it right now. Yeah, go look right. at it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You'll Good night.